كل نفس ذائقة الموت Over the centuries, billions of people have walked across the surface of this earth. No two people are the same, each experiencing life in their own unique way. Their background, their families, their ambitions and their futures all remain unique to each individual. However, one thing we share in common, each one of us one day will taste death. Death is inevitable. Everything bar the Lord himself will perish. Death can be seen all around us, from the withering of leaves in the autumn to the decomposition of food. Everything in this world must come to an end. Despite knowing this, death is often a topic we avoid. We falsely draw comfort associating death with the elderly, but in reality, none of us know when our time will come. O creatures of Allah, fear Allah and anticipate your death by good actions. Purchase everlasting joy by paying transitory things, pleasures of this world. Get ready for the journey, for you are being driven, and prepare yourselves for death, since it is hovering over you. Be a people who wake up when called, and who know that this world is not their abode. Sermon 64, Nahjul Balagha the days and nights are taking us closer and closer. That feeling should be there. The, the dua that we have, Ya Allah, make me rise from this uh, world of deception and direct my attention to the world of eternity. Because this world is not, is very temporary, is very transient, it deceives us. In the sense, why we call it the world of deception? Because we think that everything is going to go on forever. If we have that feeling, if we bring it upon ourselves, and that needs help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, If a man will see how quickly his death is approaching, he will abhor ambitions and will give up admiring the world. The person is ignorant. You know, Imam Amir Mumineen would clearly say, nas a'da ma jahilu. They're the enemies of that which they're ignorant of. So when they're ignorant of death, they don't know about death, you'll find they've taken a backward stance. You know, death will never get me. And I don't know what about it. I don't know. I don't want to know anything about it. And on top of that, I have that fear in me. وجاءت سكرة الموت بالحق ذلك ما كنت منه تحيد. To ensure we live as true believers, ready to meet our Lord at any point, we must remind ourselves of death, keeping it within our consciousness. It is narrated that during his imprisonment, Imam al Hadi alayhi salam had a grave dug and ready by the side of his prayer mat. The Imam explained, In order to remember my end, I keep the grave before my eyes. Death is simply a continuation of life, but in a different form. Those who are obedient to Allah, leading a virtuous life, would welcome the chance of leaving this temporary world to live in eternal bliss in the proximity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Holy Prophet wasallam said, you have not been created to perish, but to remain forever. Only you transfer from one home to another, and the souls are strangers on earth and are in the bodies like prisoners. Death can be analysed from two aspects. One, through the soul as it begins its journey into the afterlife, or secondly, from the perspective of those still alive as they prepare the deceased to enter the grave. Many of us live life without much awareness of what the future holds, but do we understand the journey the soul is about to embark upon?
while we are still in this world, while the body is still functioning, while the soul is still managing the body, because it's the soul which manages the body, then it's possible that the door to the other world is open, the angels are seen. And that moment for us may be just a couple of seconds, a couple of minutes or a couple of hours, but for the person who is just on the verge of leaving, it may last long. They may experience many things that we do not understand. That may be very pleasant and maybe not very pleasant, maybe on the contrary, quite unpleasant actually, depending on how people is attached to this world. We do hear many times that a person, as we've got closer towards death, that their loved ones would say, that I've seen them in a situation where they're preparing or they will tell us. And we'll find it mainly on the believers. We have many accounts from the ulama, from their families, people that are you know, quite religious, God-fearing. Uh, there's many accounts that they would tell, not just you know, by week or by day, but so specific that they would even know the hour of their death. Imam Ali السلام, says, You are the game that death hunts. If you stand still, it will seize you. If you run away, it will overtake you. When we talk about believer and non-believer, of course, we have to be careful not to, we are not talking in terms of, uh, uh, of a specific faith, all right? I mean, we have people who believe in God, believe in whatever they, they are doing in terms of their religion. Of course, what, what we are talking about, believers, we are talking about these people. Certainly, believers in Islam have the reception of Prophet peace be upon him, have higher uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, levels there because, not because of course they are intrinsically better, because they have followed a better instruction for life. When we talk about disbelievers, disbelievers are categorized in different uh, categories. There are some disbelievers who are really evil, some disbelievers who are not evil. Well, I've been very good, actually. I've lived a life of a very ethical life. For them, uh, things may be very easy, but not, of course, that sort of reception that the believers receive, taken to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, coming back. But it's not harsh. They, they will be left to live a life of, uh, of, if good, a life of joy and happiness until the day of resurrection comes. If evil, of course, that would be very unpleasant. That would be the most uh, a tormenting situation. We have a tradition that suggests Nabi Allah Ibrahim, the angel of death would come and he would ask him, are you here to see me or are you here to extract my soul? So the angel would reply by saying, I've come as a qabith, a person that will extract your soul. He says, but I see you as a very beautiful man wearing white garments, your fragrance is very beautiful. He says, is that what the believers would see? And he says, yes, a believer would see me approach him. And Ibrahim would say, if a believer would see you coming towards him, he wouldn't fear death. He says, but how about a disbeliever? Because a disbeliever, will he see you in the same form or will he see a different form that you will be in? And the angel would reply by saying, you cannot handle seeing me in the form that the disbeliever sees. And Ibrahim would turn to him and say, can you show me what the disbeliever would see? And he says, you can't handle it. He says, not, but I'd like to see, to increase my certainty. And so he would say to Ibrahim, Ibrahim, turn your face and then look back towards me so I may change my form. And the tradition says Ibrahim would turn away for moments and he'd look back towards the angel of death. When he turns back towards the angel of death, he faints from what he sees. And the tradition goes on to say that he saw a man that was charcoal from fire, uh, being very difficult to look at with teeth that were quite frightening. Fire surrounded him. Fire would be uh, coming out of his ears, his nostrils. It had such a, a horrific scene to Ibrahim that he fainted. When he wakes up, the interesting thing that he mentions, he says, Oh, angel of death, if Allah doesn't have a punishment and reward system 
for his believers and disbelievers. It's enough for a disbeliever that he sees the angel coming towards him as punishment. So you can imagine what Ibrahim saw at that very moment. And you have to understand that was just seeing him, not feeling the pain and punishment that is associated with the extraction of the soul once that angel comes. For those people that have the extraction process to be a lot easier than others, give the example of a person smelling a flower, so a, a beautiful scent that they would smell and then their souls will be extracted. Others, you'll find, suggest that because of a believer finding this world to be a jail for them, that it's a release from the chains that they're in. So leaving this world is like breaking free of chains to the hereafter, and that's their main understanding and experience of the soul leaving their body. Others would say it's like taking dirty clothes off and putting on new clothes that are clean, that are beautiful, that are fragrant. And then there are those that we have traditions suggesting that have it quite painful during this process of the soul extraction. Of the traditions that we have suggests the pain, uh, examples of the pain would be if you were to imagine a person having nail clippers made of fire and to be in every single part of that body simultaneously until that soul is extracted. Others would suggest that it's as if it's a whip made of fire continuously lashing you until your soul is extracted. In many narrations we have that the soul of the believer as soon as is taken by the angel of death there are angels which receive him or her with respect. So to speak, they just lay a red carpet before the soul to enter the realm of Malakut. And then they take the soul up to the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah greets him. Of course, these are all metaphorical. We shouldn't take it as, uh, uh, as, as literal. So Allah greets him. There's no pleasure more than this. Nothing that could be experienced in this world. Nothing that could be explained, the pleasure of the soul when they leave. This is, we are talking about a believer, of course. And then when they go there, Allah greets them. And then the angels are told, take him back. Lay him in his, in his place until the day comes that when they are all resurrected again and come back to me. So amongst the hardest, hardest moments in a person's life after the soul is extracted is when they're put into the grave. When a person is put into the grave, Imam Zain Abidin describes it by saying it's as if you come from the highest mountain towards the deepest area of the ground. So you can imagine such a massive impact on the life of a human being and indeed their soul. So much to say that that wahsha that they have, as we refer to one of the things that Sayyidah Fatima would say to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, is that when you bury me in the night, stay with me. Read Quran, be next to my grave. For that's the hardest time for a person that's buried. We find in our traditions that a person should pray Salatul Wahsha for that individual that's just being buried to help them during that difficult time before the questioning in the grave occurs. So that wahsha is that period between when a person's buried and until Munkar and Nakir would come and they will begin to question that individual. That sense of being alone, being by yourself, not having anyone by your side, you know, being in that dark grave you know, the only thing by your side is your a'mal, basically. 
The Holy Prophet Muhammad says, Death is the last stage in this world, but is the first stage in the various stages of the hereafter. So every individual will go through the questioning process and we have in our traditions that the angels that are associated with the questioning are by the names of Munkar and Nakir. And they will ask you first and foremost, who is your Lord? And see what your reply would be. Secondly, they'll ask you who your prophet is. Who do you follow? Whether you'd be a Christian, whether you'd be a Jew, you know, you'd have to reply by saying, I follow this particular prophet. The third is, what's your religion? What religion do you follow? Number four is, what is your book? So what text do you hold on to from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you live your life by? And number five, who is your imam? That's why we have the traditions. If a person would die and not know the imam of his time, he would die the death of an infidel. We, we can look at it from two different aspects. One is that these angels have come to interrogate us, which of course has no meaning. It's, it's senseless that angels, angels come interrogating us for it. The other is that they have come to help us to realize what depth of knowledge we have earned in this life about Allah about his message, about ourselves. And then according to that, they categorize us. They put us in our place. Before that, before these angels come and question, which are called Nakir and Munkar or Bashir and Mubashir, the same thing, they are the same angels, but for some, they look like bringing good news. Why? Because when they bring up the depth of their understanding, it's all joyful, it's joyous. They, 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 they are delighted by what they, by the, what they see, that the meaning of things that they were actually believing in this world, how it transpires there in that world, they are delighted. That's why these angels, for them, are called Bashir and Mubashir, the one who gives the good news. For others, the angels are Nakir and Munkar, because whatever they say, whatever they want to bring to the understanding of the person in that world, they cannot understand it. They are quite strangers to it. There's nothing familiar for them. The reality of these questions in the grave is how much you've applied these questions within your life. If you, for example, know that Allah is your Lord, but you, your entire life have worshipped, let's say, wealth, then you won't be able to reply to Munkar and Nakir. If you've known that you've followed Rasulullah, you've followed the religion of Islam, Quran is your book, Ali is your Imam, but you haven't followed in their footsteps, you haven't learned from the Qur'an, you haven't applied that to your life, you won't be able to reply to Munkar and Nakir. So it's not just solely that I need to understand, you know, in a text perspective or a memorization perspective, rather more of an application perspective towards my life. Before that angel come, those angels come, we are told that there's another angel, which is Fattan al the examiner of the graves. This angel's uh, duty is to somehow uh, uh, activate 
the spiritual memory. Because when the soul leaves, we live in another body, which is a spiritual body. And that, there's no brain, the brain is dead. This angel comes and activates it fully. It says that, write whatever you have done in your life. Whatever it means, of course, there's no pen and paper there. So the soul says, I cannot remember all of it. He says, I make you remember and activate something which everything that we have done in this world becomes so vivid in front of our eyes. Okay? And then those two angels come to somehow analyze that, examine it, and place us where we have to be. of the grave is a purifying process you know before we are actually uh, on the verge of destruction in in hell because that's destruction Allah has put many many stages in which we are filtered so that we do not reach that stage of destruction and there are stages of purification when we want to enter Barzakh, of course, we should have a, a, a good life. A good life cannot uh, accompany evil. Both the believers and non-believers, they have certain evil in them. Now, even very good believers may have certain evil in them. That squeezing of the grave, which of course is not physical, it is the uh, the soul which experiences it, not the body. Uh, interestingly, uh, someone asks Imam Ali, the Imam Ali Salam that, what about those who are who are crucified on uh, on the palm trees, for example, and they are not buried for a long time? What about squeezing of the grave? Uh, the Imam said the air would squeeze them. That means that it's not something physical. Okay. Uh, there are certain evil in us which Allah wants to somehow squeeze it out of us before we enter properly. For some, it is, it is non-existence because they didn't have any evil in them. For some, it may be very hard because the, the, the amount of evil in them is great. Uh, by evil, I mean, for example, a person may be quick-tempered. A person may be uh, abusive in language. A person may be careless about their children, for example. Or children may be careless about their parents. Now, these type of evils which are in people should be squeezed out. And that's the squeezing of the grave. Uh, the example which is always uh, cited here is the example of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, a great companion of the Prophet, the one who spread Islam in Medina before Prophet entering in Medina. We know that Medina were all... Uh, a, a city which was converted to Islam completely before the entrance of the Prophet, peace be on him. And Sa'ad ibn Ma'az was one of those people who were influential. He was the head of the Aus uh, tribe and converted the whole Aus into Islam. And he was, of course, uh, injured in battle of uh, Ahzab and was martyred. On his 
martyrdom on his burial prophet came out barefooted he gave him his own dress to be used as the shroud he prayed for him long and went into his grave everyone said wow what nice for Sa'd ibn Mu'az, how lucky he is what Prophet did to him. Prophet said, do not rush in judgment. He is now squeezed in a grave to an extent that you cannot imagine. His brain is coming out of his nose. And he said, how is it possible? He said, because he was quick-tempered with his family. He didn't treat them well. So, despite being a very great Muslim, and very good companion, that evil, that sort of impurity should come out of him before he's checked in into Barzakh. Amongst our traditions would suggest very interestingly, the first would come forth and say that if a person was to recite every Friday Surat al-Nisa, every Friday Allah will safeguard him from the squeeze of the grave. Another tradition would say if you were in your Salat to recite chapter 68 of the Holy Quran, Surat al-Qalam, that Allah will safeguard you from the squeeze of the grave. And another tradition would suggest if you were to be up in Salatul Layl. That Salatul Layl is one of the things that Allah has bestowed upon us of beauty. And amongst the rewards that we gain from this is that He safeguards us from that squeeze within the grave. So these are the different things that we can apply to our life if we fee for ourselves from this squeeze of the grave. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq said, The purgatory or barzakh of the grave is the reward and the punishment between the world and the hereafter. Barzakh is one of these beautiful, beautiful realms between this world and the hereafter. So you understand when a person dies, there's a long time between death and resurrection. So that period between death and our souls extracted until the hereafter, that period is known as Barzakh. Now Barzakh, many people have asked the question, is it in the heavens? Because it's your soul at the end of the day that's in Barzakh, not your human body. Is it in the heavens? Is it under the earth? Well, the traditions would suggest no, it's in the exact same plane that you and I are in. That they're on earth. But they are veiled from us. That's where Barzakh comes into perspective. Maraj al Bahraini al Taqiyan bainahuma Barzakhun la yabriyan fabi ayya ala irabikuma tukadiban. There's a veil that you do not see between you and them. When we go to Barzakh, our life is upgraded. We, are, we upgrade to something much higher. Both those who are good and who are bad, we all upgrade. However, of course, when we upgrade, the pain upgrades, the pleasure upgrades, the, uh, the, the, the emotions upgrade, everything upgrades. So we live their life as... Uh, uh, it's explained in the words of Aima alayhi salam that they live in bodies like these bodies. They eat, they drink, they visit each other, they go places. Depending on what sort of level they are in Barzakh, they, uh, they enjoy restriction or freedom. They enjoy pain, uh, they, they experience pain or enjoy pleasure. So depending on the person. Now in that 
realm there are different areas. There's a paradise of Barzakh, there's a hell of Barzakh. Some people, those who are really pure, purely pure, they enter the paradise of Barzakh, they live there. And some enter the hell of Barzakh, and after that they directly go to the hell of the hereafter. However, majority of the people, majority of the people live not in that bar paradise or in that hell. It's something in between. They may have windows to that paradise or windows to that hell, depending on whether they are good or evil. They may have tormenting experiences or elating experiences until the, comes the judgment day. Their judgment is postponed until the day of judgment. For 99% of the people, it's like that. But within Barzakh, you can also find that someone that, like we said, is a believer, there could be some sins that you need to still be accountable for, even within Barzakh. So you'll find they'll be in a garden of heaven, but they may have a particular action that they still need to be punished for. So during that day that they have within Barzakh, they still may be, in one way or another, punished in a specific time frame for that sin that they've sinned, let's say, or that amal that they've transgressed against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes souls want to pass a message to this world to a close relative like their children. They cannot come and communicate with them directly. They go to a far relative, for example, or a friend to pass their message because that soul is more prepared to be connected with rather than the other souls. So not with everyone that they like, not at any time that they like. We have in narration that souls are given permission to come and look at their families, for example, what, how they are faring, what they are doing. And uh, this may happen once a week, this may happen once a month, once a day, once a year, depending on the, the, the strength of the soul, the freedom that they enjoy there in, in Barzakh. The higher the status of a person, the more freedom they, they enjoy. But the beauty about the believer soul is the angel will only show you that which Yusirruka, or Yusirru Nafsika, meaning makes you happy. So he won't show you anything that displeases your soul because you're a believer. And on the flip side, for a disbeliever, when he was to see his family, he will see his family performing deeds which hurt them. So he'll see their fa his family doing sins, committing things of oppression against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, doing actions which would not make him happy nor proud of how his children are, how his family is. So hurting them and punishing that soul even further. Many times we'd learn from them in the dream. Many instances we'd know if they're in trouble, if they need a particular act to be performed, for a punishment to be raised from them within Barzakh. If they have anything owing, they usually come and tell us, can you please do this for us in order for this punishment to be lifted? So in the world of Alam al-Ru'ya, 
the world of the dream is one that you can have contact. سؤال منكر ونكير إياي. It is of the utmost importance that we educate ourselves and come to terms with the only certainty we have in this life, death. As we pass through the various stages in our lives, facing different obstacles and challenges, keeping perspective of our ultimate reality should focus our efforts and guide us to make the right decisions for both this life and the hereafter. But, before our soul can embark on this great journey, the body of the deceased must first go through a journey of its own. The family members and the community come together to prepare the body in its final attire before being lowered into the ground. Reports indicate that the soul lingers around its body, still feeling an emotional connection to it, watching their family mourn, watching as they are washed and shrouded, watching their body be carried to the cemetery with an immense feeling of sensitivity and often fear. It is advised that when handling the body of a deceased to be gentle and kind as the soul feels every touch and every movement. We met with a team of volunteers for the funeral services at Haydari Islamic Center to guide us through the steps they take when they receive a body. Shabazz Khan, the team's youngest volunteer, offered to act as the body to perform a demonstration of the Islamic rituals required when someone passes away. It is not often someone will experience the funeral rituals firsthand before their passing. Most of us will experience this when our time is up and it is our body lying on the table as our soul will watch from above. So we were intrigued to find out what impact this experience had on Shabazz. Being in that position, it was, it was, it was, it was weird to say the least, um, but at the same time, enjoyable. You'd think, um, what are the things that matter to me? What parts of my life was I proud of? What parts of my life am I not proud of? It's your preparation to meet Allah and hopefully meet the Ahlul Bayt and for me it was like a, you know like a shower you have before graduation you want to get ready for that that's how I see death it's scary because everyone has to face it and you're leaving this dunya for the next one but it's nice knowing that the people that are going to prepare you for that know what they're doing. Previously to joining the Skusil Kafan Committee, I was fairly scared of dead bodies. and Even if it was my relative, someone from my family passed away and I was scared to be near the dead body. Uh, once I started becoming accustomed to dealing with this, um, it really changes your outlook on life. You stop fearing death. You start realizing how much of a certainty death is. And once you realize how much of a certainty death is, the less scared of it you become. A lot of people will try and push it away and think, oh, you know what, it's not, it's not going to happen to me. <laughs> We've had children through to elders come through for many, many different reasons. Doing the ghusl and guffin for them adds that extra sense of you know, it could be me next, it could definitely be me next. And you come to the realization of that. And um, it, it, it helps you become a better person when you come to realize it could be you next. Um, because, uh, you know, like people might tell you in the madrasa when you're growing up, pray every namaz like it's your last namaz. That kicks in because you, like I said, no one knows who's next. That's, that's, that's God's will, you know, could be me, could be you, could be anyone, could be anyone. The, the more firm you realize that through helping out and through
through being part of the Gusul Kafan committees in your mosques or helping out with this process, the more firm I think it helps you be on your religion. Throughout the centuries, every man to walk this earth, be they rich or poor, educated or not, the only certainty is death. Understandably so, it is a concept most of us fear. The unfamiliarity and the ambiguity is scary. However, we must understand this world is not our final abode. And, if we want to continue our journey into the hereafter, to be one of joy and comfort, Blessed with the presence of the 14 infallibles, we must use our time in this world to prepare and be ready to meet our Lord. Imam Zain Abidin shows us, you know, Dua Abu Hamza Thumali. You know, he tells us about, you know, this is a, a, a place where it's uncertain, lonely new, you know, a place of wahsha, loneliness, a place where you don't know, it's, it's a different scale of what we know in this world, you know, what, what governs this world, the laws that govern this world, is different to the laws that govern, you know, the grave, the barzakh. Involving ourselves with the death committees of our local communities will aid us in coming to terms with the reality of this life, in recognizing the fragility of this world and accepting our inevitable destiny. Through this, every action, every decision we make, will consider how truly beneficial is this to me. And people who forget this, who do not want to think about it, who just want to somehow throw it behind and say it comes one day, are living in illusion. They are actually forgetting the most real, the most definitive factor in our lives. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't live uh, properly, we shouldn't live rationally. It's just a feeling which gives us reality of the world rather than illusion in the world. And Imam al Baqarah says one of these days that you should remember is the day of your death. Mutu qabla anta mutu. You should die before you die. And that's the thing we need to take from this tradition because if we were knowingly going to die in an hour we would make sure our whole life changes very dramatically so when we know we're going to die in an hour we change those things and imam says if you were to change those things and you know why don't you change them now if you've transgressed repent if you know you have things owing go and return them if you have salat, siyam, zakat, make sure you perform them. Die before you die in the instance that prepare for death. And that's all we can do before Malik al would come. Keeping it in the forefront of our minds and learning more about death will not only make the concept less unknown and scary, but we will also begin to better understand how performing certain actions will assist us in the hereafter. So in our traditions, we find that the angel of death circulates the world five times every night. So you'll find the angel of death is on top of your house five times every night, waiting for Allah to say, is this the day that I extract this soul or isn't it? And that should really make us wake up to the fact that death is lingering near us and that we need to make a change within our lives towards the better so we can seek their rewards in the hereafter, inshallah.
alone in our graves, our deeds and a'mals will be the only thing to provide us with comfort and support, while holding on to the wilaya of the Ahlul Bayt will act as our guide through the next world. وارحمني صريعا على الفراش تقلبني أيدي أحبتي وتفضل علي ممدودا على المغتسل يقلبني صالح جيرتي وتحنأن علي محمولا قد تناول الأقرباء وأطراف جنازتي وجد علي منقولا قد نزلت بك وحيدا في حفرتي